A very good evening, everyone. Welcome again to our live session. So there were so many interruptions previously, and in fact, uh, we literally counted. There were around five to six interruptions, and uh, I'm glad that we postponed this session because there was again an interruption at 7:28 p.m., 7:40 p.m., around 8:15 p.m. Hopefully now uh, the network streaming seems to be stable. So I think we can go ahead without any interruptions, hopefully. If in case, worst case scenario, if there is again in another interruption, and if you're not able to stream live, we'll postpone it for tomorrow. All right, I'm talking about 7 p.m. session. So tomorrow morning, 5 a.m. sessions, we can have them as usual, right? So uh, I really appreciate uh, you guys for understanding and uh, for having that patience. And in fact, before I start, I would like to cite this as an example. So whenever you wish to do something, it's not that everything goes as per the plan. We planned 7 p.m. session, but now it's 9 p.m. session. So sometimes there will be interruptions. Uh, we can anticipate interruptions. There is nothing wrong in it. But uh, once there is any challenge or interruption, rather than getting carried away, rather than uh, feeling frustrated, or rather than uh, giving it up, we should, you know, just allow some time. See, in, in this case, we allowed a few hours of time. So now we're able to stream fine. In real life scenarios, maybe we need to allow more amount of time. Maybe a few hours, few days, few weeks, sometimes few months or even few years. But definitely if you have that noble intention and if it is pure, right? Whatever your intention is, you will definitely succeed. You will definitely accomplish all that you dream of without any doubt. So with this, let's start our live session. I hope it is streaming fine. I hope oh, I'm audible. And uh, do let me know if you have any issues with streaming quality. 
And after your feedback, we'll go ahead with our live session and we'll try to complete it off in 20, 30 minutes maximum, right? Because we have to sleep early and wake up early for 5 a.m. club, isn't it? So do let me know how the streaming is going on. You know, sometimes it, it, it happened uh, quite often uh, previously also. After giving introduction, I used to observe and it used to be in mute. The session used to be in mute. So it's a double bonanza. It used to be double bonanza for me. Luckily now, it's not in mute. So I hope I was audible. Yeah, one of you do let me know. If you have any issues with streaming, do let me know in the comment section. I'll, I'll right away see if I can do something to overcome the same. So today's live session, we'll go ahead with our first live session officially, a 7 p.m. session. We'll have MCQs discussion from different subjects, so it's cumulative format, and we'll uh, try to highlight certain key points. Thank you, Swadina, for letting me know. Thank you very much. So, as I said, it's a cumulative discussion. So before we go ahead, so this is the first session of this week. We're going to plan such sessions in the coming days till Friday. So I request all of you to keep the following things in mind. First and foremost, whatever points or whatever topics you come across in these live sessions, consider them very, very important. Just assume that these questions are going to be repeated in the final exam. If you have this perspective, you'll take things very seriously. You'll be very attentive. And second, do maintain notes. Consider this very, very important. Have an exclusive notes for all our live sessions as we'll be covering hundreds and hundreds of points in the coming days, right? Uh, till the date of your entrance exam. And third, active participation. Try to enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy the process because you'll be learning so many things with clinical applications. I'm sure it's going to be very interesting. So have the clinical correlation in mind, try to enjoy the session rather than taking it as a mandatory mode of learning. Uh, there is nothing mandatory here. You're free to watch these sessions. You're free to make notes. So these are some tips from our side. And I hope this will help you in the process of your preparation. Right, so with these introductory comments, we made all these introductory comments previously as well. However, because of technical issues, we had to cut down those streams and remove those videos. So for that sake, I'm repeating again. Okay, so let's go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Sujay, for the feedback. Yeah, let's go ahead. And here is our presentation for today. So first and foremost, so as I said, the format is MCQ's discussion from various key topics. Here we go. So this morning we had a 5 a.m. session and in 5 a.m. session, I've given you question for the day, right? I hope you remember it, pick it, lick it, stick it. You might find it strange. So let's start with that question. The first question, Picket, liquid, sticket protocol is to be followed during management of fractured tooth, management of avulsive tooth, management of intrusion, none of the above. So you can keep your score, the right answer plus four, wrong answer minus one. Okay, so total score is going to be 20. We have five questions, so maximum score of 20. So at the end of the session, you can reveal your scores. So pick it, lick it, stick it protocol is to be followed during which of the following uh, conditions or clinical scenarios? Management of fractured tooth, management of evulsive tooth, management of, uh, yeah, I'm sorry for the spelling mistake of management, yeah, intrusion and none of the above. In fact, Swadina has uh, replied to this query uh, through mail. Yes, yeah. so which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So if you know the management of as majority of you are uh, have rightly mentioned, yes, that's the right answer. But before I reveal what the answer is, let me have a brief uh, literature review, right? And then we'll go ahead with the key. So first and foremost, 
we have certain dental emergencies. So first of all, it's very important that we should differentiate between an emergency and emergency. This is one of the questions which was posed to us during our post-graduation. We had no clue uh, way back then because we never uh, found out the answer. But there is a major difference between an urgency and emergency. In simple terms, emergency is something which is which has something to do with life, a life threatening, right? In such situations, we call that instance as emergency. Evulsion, does it fall under emergency? Yes or no? What do you think? Yeah, evulsion, extrusion. So in certain clinical situations, if there is, uh, there can be aspiration, right? So that's considered as an emergency. So dental emergencies. So the only traumatic dental injuries that require immediate emergency management are evulsion and extrusion, in particular, if there is a risk of inhalation of the tooth in question. So an avulsive tooth should ideally be replanted within minutes at the scene of the incident. When the patient subsequently attends the surgery, preferably as soon as possible following the replantation, a full reassessment has to be carried out, checking that the tooth has been repositioned correctly. If this is not the case, apical pressure should be applied using index finger and thumb to correctly reposition the tooth under local anesthesia. In fact, I witnessed my uh, first case while I was assisting my professor way back in uh, third or second videos. That was the first case I've witnessed. Patient actually uh, brought the tooth. There was a phone call prior. So there was some interaction, some guidelines from our professor to the uh, patient's uh, parents. They brought the tooth in milk. I, I still remember. And then uh, our professor implanted that, re-implanted the tooth, and then uh, they've done some wire composite splinting way back then. They're still uh, very clear and vivid in my memory. So once there is clinical exposure, it's going to be much more fun, isn't it? So once correctly positioned and the occlusion confirmed, the tooth should be temporarily splinted to the adjacent teeth and a radiograph has to be taken. Splinting duration varies from two to four weeks depending upon the extra oral dry time, which actually decides the prognosis of the tooth uh, in this situation, as you all know. So unfortunately, despite public health programs to raise awareness of what to do if a tooth is knocked clean out of the mouth, trauma persists with an evulsive tooth often, yeah, yeah. Trauma patients with an evulsive tooth often attend the dental surgery with the tooth wrapped safely in tissue resulting in death of any delicate periodontal ligament cells that survived the trauma. So transport medium is very, very important. So awareness has to be uh, created and we should take this information to the public. If uh, Hank's Bank's uh, uh, balanced salt solution is not available, save a tooth medium is not available. At least milk is something which is readily available or in worst case scenarios, patient's own mouth can be used provided the patient is uh, mature enough to understand the fact that that should not be swallowed. So, under such circumstances, reimplantation may be contraindicated if the tooth is wrapped in kind of tissue and brought up hazardly. So, if an evulsive tooth is not replanted immediately, the storage medium uh, to transport the tooth becomes critical. See, as you know, primary tooth is not replanted, uh, reimplanted. It's only the permanent teeth we're talking about. So various media have been investigated in an effort to replicate the environment of tooth socket and provide optimal conditions to maintain the viability of periodontal ligament cells. Consider this very, very important. That's the objective of using a transport medium to carry this evulsive tooth, isn't it? Balanced salt solution formulations such as Save tooth are being marketed. If such medium is not available, a readily available alternative is cold milk. Dentists should be prepared to give advice to member of public over the phone concerning the immediate management of an evulsive tooth as immediate reimplantation provides the best outcome, extra oral dry time. The advice in layman terms should be as follows. Yeah, here comes this strategy of pick it, lick it, and stick it. And as you all rightly mentioned, option B is right answer. So. By looking in the injured person's mouth, make sure it is a permanent tooth, keep the person calm. That is the dentist instructions uh, to the patient. Locate the tooth and pick it up by the crown, making sure to avoid contact with the root. So pick it with the crown, but not do not touch the root. 
That's that's how you instruct your patient. If 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 the tooth is dirty, run it briefly for around ten seconds under cold running water. Pour bottle water over it and or have the patient lick the tooth. Saliva is better. The surface of the root should not be rubbed to remove dirt. So this is the next part of the protocol that is lick it. And then you have your third part that is sticking it or placing it in or re-implanting for that matter. Encourage and assist the person to replace the tooth back in the socket with the person holding the tooth by the crown between the index finger and the thumb. Once the tooth is back in place, ask the person to bite on a tissue or towel to hold the tooth in position. If replacement is not possible, then the tooth should be placed in an appropriate storage medium, as we just discussed. Why? Right? To maintain the viability of periodontal ligament cells. The advisor assists the person in obtaining immediate help from the dentist. And as we discussed previously, extraoral diatom is something which plays a very important role in deciding the prognosis of or the longevity of that particular tooth in patient's oral cavity. So as majority of you rightly mentioned, option B is the right answer, okay? Very good, well done. So those who have chosen option B, mark or give yourself or award yourself four marks. Now let's move on to the next question. Observe this instrument. I'm sure majority of you might have seen, uh, practitioners of course know about this. So what is this device? Measuring device, Bole gauge, gauge, Bole gauge, dividers, Ivanson gauge. So which option do you think is more appropriate answer? So observe the instrument carefully. If you want, I can give you a clue. If anyone wants a clue, do let me know. So what instrument is this? It seems to be some kind of measuring device, but would you choose option A? That would be risky, right? I mean, uh, what if there is even more specific answer? Of course, it's a measuring device, but what if there is even more specific answer? I've given you the hint. Okay, is it measuring device, Bole gauge, dividers, Ivanson gauge? I know it's a difficult or challenging question, don't worry. So this is something which is used to measure the thickness of porcelain or metal. Fix it, uh, crown processes, a prosthodontic department. I'm sure you might have seen. Also, uh, I've seen some of the students or uh, you know, postgraduates using it to measure the thickness of wax, provided the wax sheet is covered by the thick, uh, by a matrix pan. Uh, this is one of the techniques which we even followed uh, during our post-graduation. So it's a measuring device, but uh, I, I would be glad if you are even more specific. Uh, by the way, option B is not the right answer. And as I said, this is used for measuring thickness of porcelain or a metal, right? So as you can see, the gradation is in millimeters or one tenth of uh, millimeters. So this is nothing but Ivanson gaze. So option, yeah, option D is right answer. If none of you have chosen it, don't worry. Well tried, okay? So Ivanson gaze, it's used for measuring thickness of porcelain metal, calibrated in millimeters and one tenth millimeter. Option D is the right answer. So if you haven't chosen option D, do mark or award yourself minus one. Okay. Okay, very good. Well tried. Now let's move on to our next question. Okay, Vinita, very good. So third question, the process of shaping a patient's behavior through appropriately time feedback is positive reinforcement. Voice control, distraction, tell shadow technique. This is something which we discussed very recently in our study club as well. So what's this process called? The process of shaping a patient's behavior through appropriately timed feedback. Positive reinforcement, voice control, distraction, tell, show, do technique. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? So first and foremost, behavior shaping. See, behavior shaping is something which we're all subjected to. And our parents, our teachers uh, play a major role in uh, one's behavior shaping. 
including society fears. There are so many factors which influence our behavior. The behavior shaping means providing the child with cues and reinforcements that direct them towards a desirable behavior. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, other things or it goes other way also, but that's the objective of behavior shaping, right? Do this, do that, that's what we keep telling. Positive reinforcement at every stage of treatment process is uh, recommended to indicate to the child that he is making successful steps in the process of receiving treatment. Voice control modulation is done to gain patient's attention. Distraction, it is uh, diverting patient's attention, uh, which decreases likelihood of unpleasant perception of threshold. You might have seen several videos in social media where a uh, pediatrician uh, trying to inject a child uses distraction technique very efficiently. Child experiences no pain or minimal pain. Isn't it? Tell show do, as you know, it allays fears, shapes, patients, response, gives expectations of behavior. So you're telling, showing, doing. So you have these components in the options, which I have given brief description of. So which one do you think is more appropriate answer? Yeah, the process of shaping a patient's behavior through appropriately timed feedback. Okay, majority of you uh, seem to be uh, choosing option D. However, it's positive reinforcement, which is right answer. So positive reinforcement is a process of shaping patient's behavior through appropriately timed feedback. The best example I can give you is a big time theory, Sheldon giving chocolates or candies to Penny, right? Uh, the more, uh, in order to, you know, uh, or whenever Penny does something he likes. Uh, positive reinforcement, maybe, yeah. So a uh, positive reinforcement, the objective is to reinforce a desired behavior. It can be done on any patient. There are no specific contraindications for the same. So positive reinforcement at every stage of treatment process is recommended to indicate to the child that he's making successful steps in process of receiving treatment. The frequent use of praise during a child's appointment when the child performs an appropriate behavior is essential. Having said that, positive reinforcement need not be just verbal can be even non-verbal. So positive reinforcement may be verbal or non-verbal and should be immediate and specific to desirable uh, behavior. It's not that we uh, provide praise or give praise after a few hours or after a few days. It doesn't work out that way, right? And among these, I just wanted to highlight uh, two things apart from positive reinforcement. That is, tell show to technique. It is indicate in all patients who can communicate regardless of method of communication. This is a very, very important indication. Coming to voice control, indications, uncooperative, without any doubt. Uh, this is something which we uh, tend to use on pets or uh, children who make or do all uh, crazy kind of things and stuff. So indications of voice control include uncooperative or inattentive but communicative child. Contraindications for voice control is very, very important. Do make a note. Children who are unable to understand due to age, disability, medications, or emotional immaturity. So these are specific contraindications for voice control. Do make a note of them. And those who have answered it wrong, don't worry. You're not going to repeat this mistake again, isn't it? So option A is right answer. Positive reinforcement. Well done. So those who have chosen option B, uh, go ahead with, yes. Option A, yeah, option A, uh, go ahead with a four marks. Penultimate question. Let's see how many of you are going to answer it right. On the cusps of human molars and premolars, the enamel attains a maximum thickness of 1 to 2 mm, 2 to 2.5 mm, 2.8 mm, none of the above. What is this 2.8? It seems to be something specific, right? Okay, on the cusps of human molars and premolars, the enamel attains a maximum thickness of. So, no idea, don't worry. You're going to learn now. In the meantime, you can, uh, of course, uh, do a guesswork. Uh, even though I'm pretty sure that majority of you are going to answer it right. Okay, okay, very good, well done. 
So as majority have chosen, that's the right answer. 2 to 2.5 mm. Enamel forms predictive covering of variable thickness of the entire surface of crown as we're all familiar with, especially when during tooth sectionings during our first year or second year preclinical exercises. On the cusps of human molars and premolars, the enamel attains a maximum thickness of about 2 to 2.5 mm, thinning down to almost knife edge at the neck of tooth. However, one should always remember that the thickness of enamel is more on lingual surfaces of maxillary molars and buccal surfaces of mandibular molars. Why? Why is there more thickness of enamel in these specific areas? I'm going to leave this question unanswered. Consider this as your homework question. Why is the thickness of enamel more on lingual surfaces of maxillary molars and buccal surfaces of mandibular molars comparatively? What's the reason? And as majority of you have chosen, option B is right answer. By the way, 2.8 is specific gravity of enamel. It's not mm, but 2.8 value is a specific gravity of enamel, as I'm sure majority of you are very much familiar with this. Okay. In fact, these are one of the first things we learn in the form of basics, right? Okay, very good. Well done. Those who have chosen option B, award yourself four marks. Now, final question. A patient, a I can consider this as case-based question or clinical oriented question. A patient underwent dental treatment and visited your clinic for cleaning as three months elapsed from the time of his or her treatment. Which of the following is not acceptable means for cleaning the titanium surface? Usually there is a clinical protocol that uh, implant patients should pay a visit to the dentist every three months for professional cleaning. Right, uh, plaque accumulation can happen not just on natural tooth surfaces, but even on implant surfaces, right? So in such a context, which of the following is not acceptable means for cleaning the titanium surfaces, either for you uh, or for the implant patient, right? Because if the patient goes home and in the process of cleaning uses certain materials, there can be damage to the titanium surface. There is a reason for that. Uh, titanium is considered to be soft. Let's look into that a bit later. But if you look into the options, you have conventional ultrasonic tips, plastic curettes, flaws, none of the above. So which, one, which of the following is not acceptable means for cleaning of titanium surfaces? So I think it's quite obvious. I'm glad majority of you have chosen the right answer. So titanium as a metal is relatively soft. The interesting thing is it's relatively soft and can be scratched on surface Fairly easily. And so even the probes which we use, we should be very cautious to use plastic probes, <clears throat> right? So plastic curates <clears throat> rather than metal curates are recommended for a titanium surface on implants and abutments, particularly subgingivally. The, sa the same applies in case of plastic periodontal onto probes instead of metal probes on titanium. Power tooth brushes, rest of the options. Uh, power tooth brushes, uh, you have these uh, flaws, Etc. they're considered to be absolutely safe, right? Uh, end of the br brushes, they're not harmful on titanium surfaces. Conventional metal ultrasonic tips should not be used because they do significant damage to titanium components. They might scratch or cause pitting on the surfaces, right? So we should use a specially uh, devised ultrasonic tips with a plastic or other softer coatings that are available in market. In fact, there is extensive information on the same in Caranza. Also, for your uh, information, Chlorex rinse mouth rinses, phenolic compound mouth rinses, water jet irrigators, rubber cap polishing with fine fumes can be used on implant and other titanium surfaces, right? And also, as we discussed initially, three months, you can see in the question, three months elapsed, there is a reason why I incorporated these keywords so that you would uh, uh, note this key point as well. Titanium surfaces are subject to formation of plaque and calculus. A suggested interval for implant maintenance appointment is every three months for cleaning of the surfaces and inspection of parts of the system, which can become loose with function, right? So as majority of you are rightly chosen, option A is a right answer, a well done, award yourself plus four marks. I would say skip it up. Okay, because of this dynamic hand movements, uh, my watch assumed that I was exercising and it thought I just finished, or maybe I was just continuing my dynamic workout and it says, yeah, keep it up. I don't think you can see, but it's definitely a dynamic workout.
<laughs> okay, this is really funny. We think smart watches are smart, but they are actually dumb. So who is smart? We who are using those smart watches because we design these smart watches. Okay, so these are some of the things which I wanted to highlight. And also I have some interesting information for you. I've come across uh, that news uh, just uh, before this session, during the break time previously, and I would like to read it out for you. Okay, so uh, there was uh, news on uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine 2021 was awarded to US scientists David Julius and Artem Padapautian. I'm sorry if the pronunciation is wrong. So they have been awarded jointly a Nobel Prize in Physiology of Medicine 2021. The Nobel Committee has said the prize has been given for the discoveries of receptors for temperature and touch. The duo, uh, both the scientists describe the mechanics of how humans perceive temperature and pressure through nerve impulses. So this is something which I have just come across. Uh, we'll uh, go through that article and if there is anything interesting or of course there, there must be something you haven't gone in depth, we'll get back to you accordingly, right? Receptors for pain and pressure, or is it pain and touch? Temperature and touch, okay. So what's your score? What's your maximum score? How much uh, did, did you guys score out of 20? I mean, you can evaluate for yourself or uh, you can post your scores here. So that I would, I would love to have a look, not to judge, but to understand. So maximum score of 40? No, it's 20, right? Yeah, five, four, 20. So how, how much did you guys score? So do post your scores. And I'm really glad that we had this session. As I say, uh, it's better late than never. So I'm glad this session happened without any interruption. So thank you, Nature, for allowing us to have this lovely interaction. And guys, I hope you enjoyed this session and found it informative. And as I mentioned previously, consider each and every point so important that assume that it's going to come in final exam. And I mentioned this previously also, whenever we attended any lectures during our UG or PG preparation, we had just one objective in mind. Even if you learn one point from this session or from that particular class, what if that point comes on the day of exam? So if you have that orientation, right, you will just keep giving your best. You will not take things for granted. So try doing that. And also, as I said, try to maintain notes and actively participate. So these MCQ discussions, in fact, we, we conducted a poll and large majority of you said you wanted MCQ. So I'm very glad that you have been uh, actively participating. So I really appreciate you guys for your enthusiasm. So just a couple of months for the final exam. And I'm sure you're going to rock without any doubt. Just believe in yourself, okay? Even though if the current situation seems to be challenging, as we had experienced just now in this live session, we had challenges, six, five, six interruptions. All we did is just, just hold on, just maintain your calmness and be composed. Everything will fall in place. It's only a matter of time, provided your intentions are pure. Okay, so I hope you got my point. And as I keep on reminding, just keep these three factors in mind, which are the basic ingredients of success, the preparation mantra. It's all about working hard working consistently, and most importantly, believing in yourself. So always keep these three factors in mind. Keep giving your best. The world is all yours. So I'll see you tomorrow morning at, in 5 a.m. club. So I know it's, it's a challenge, especially those who are used to studying late nights. But as we discussed in today's 5 a.m. club, uh, you're going to experience a whole uh, new world Rather, I can say, without any hesitation, wake up early in the morning, provided you sleep early, you have sufficient amount of sleep, wake up early in the morning, you'll perceive the difference. Morning, especially 4 a.m. or at least 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. is a time period where your concentration potentially is at its peak, you're least distracted, you can achieve, accomplish so many amazing things in line with your passion. And it's like it keeps perpetuating. It's like once you get used to it, will just go on spontaneously, right? 
Okay, social interest. Uh, thank you for your love. And I see, uh, yeah, a very good evening once again, all of you. Uh, I haven't checked your comments previously. Uh, Kritika, uh, very good Kritika, Swadino, Smriti, Benita, Hadi, social interest, Maheshwari, Dipanyam, Sujay. Excellent. So I really appreciate your frankness in posting your scores. The best evaluation is not done by some college or some person or some institute. The best analysis or evaluation is always done by us. I mean, I'm talking about our evaluation. So he's the best evaluator, Seth. I'm glad you've done your evaluation. <laughs> Okay, and those who have no habit of waking up early in the morning, you might find it struggling initially, but take note, just hold on. Keep pushing yourself for a couple of days in a matter of week, you'll get used to waking up early in the morning. And as I said, you'll experience a whole new world altogether. So I wish you all the best, love you all, and see you tomorrow morning at 5 a.m. And for that to happen, we should sleep early. It's 9.35 almost, so try to sleep at least by 10, 10.30 maximum. If you're watching IPL, okay, maybe CCI save you. Okay, good night guys. Love you all. Yeah. Swadino? Yes, glad to hear that Swadino. Take care.